If you would, turn with me to Matthew 18 and 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him till seven times? And Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven like unto a certain king which would take account of his servant. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him ten thousand talents. A ten thousand talents is equivalent to one million nine hundred and forty nine thousand dollars today. And this man owed his king close to two million dollars. So let's see what his king does. But for so much as he has not paid, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and his children and all that he had in payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of the servant was moved with compassion, and loosened him, and forgave him of the debt. But the same servant went out, and found one of the fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, which is equivalent to fifteen dollars. And he laid hands on him, that means he grabbed him, and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and bestowed him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when the fellow servants saw that was done, they were very sorry, and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that, he called him, saying unto him, O thy wicked servant, I forgave thee all thy debt because thou desirest me. Should not thou also have compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I have pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered unto him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Two million dollars. And he grabbed the man and wanted fifteen dollars after he had been forgiven of debt of two million or close to two million dollars. Today I want to preach on victory and prosperity through forgiveness. Now, I don't want you to be misled on the prosperity part of I'm not talking necessarily about monetary means of prosperity, but there's more than just prospering financially. Money is a small part of it. Most often does help, but that's not the prosperity that I'm going to talk about today. We prosper in different ways. We can prosper with our wives and our children and their relationship. We can prosper with our friends and our co-workers by forgiving. In our attitude of life, we can prosper. And that's the prosperity I'm talking about in the victory I'm talking about. In the attitude of life, the joy of what the Lord has done for us. In our walk with Christ, prosperity through forgiveness. Let's just not look at the obvious of this parable that Jesus has given us. Here, the obvious thing is that the man was either greedy, he was forgiven of his debt, close to $2 million, and he wanted $15 from one who was indebted to him. Let's look at the things that are not so obvious here, and that is man didn't prosper because he didn't forgive. He didn't prosper in his family and his relationship with his wife. How do you know that? Because she was sold, his children were sold, she wasn't even at the house. He was cast into prison, so he wasn't prosperous there. We find that he wasn't prosperous with his friends or his fellow servants, and could have been if he would have had forgiving heart. His reputation, I'm sure, would have been inflated as a merciful man for forgiving these who owed him of the debt. But instead, he grabbed him up for whatever reason and demanded payment and cast him into the prison. So we find him not prospering in his relationships with his fellow servants or, in our case, our friends and our co-workers because of the lack of unforgiveness. We find that he didn't have joy in his life. What joy this man should have had. What rejoicing he should have been doing instead of running to the street and grabbing up a fellow servant. What rejoicing for being released of such a great debt. Two million dollars. But instead, he ran to the streets demanding payment. Another part that is not so obvious is his relationship with his Lord and his King went from a a very good relationship to a very bad relationship real quick, didn't it? 
So his relationship with his king went sour, and his lord went sour, and his relationship with his friends and his co-servants went sour, didn't it? Just think. Let's speak hypothetically here. If this man would have forgave his fellow servants of his sins, you know it would have got back to the king. And the king would have been pleased with it because it's the same decision that he had made. As it got back to the king for what he was doing wrong, it would have got back to the king for what he was doing correctly and being merciful. The man would have prospered. The man would have been victorious over the debt and the troubles in his life. But he chose not to forgive. What is forgiveness? A definition that I come up with that pretty much covers what true forgiveness is. And it's it's an act of grace forever freeing one of the penalties for a wrongful act they have done to you. Forever freeing them from a penalty. You know, when someone does something against you that requires you to forgive them, you think they owe you something, don't you? At least you owe you an apology, right? But you have the power to release them of what they owe you as this king done. So let's dive into this a little deeper and let's look at this at a more personal level. Let's look at the physical realm of what unforgiveness does to us. The first thing it does is upset you, doesn't it? It bothers you. The next thing it does is it makes you expend time and energy and it eats at you, don't it? It eats at you. And if you're not cautious, it'll feed off of you. And then you grow angry, don't you? And it eats at you, don't it? And then you start saying things about the individual or individuals or the entity, whether it's a company or whatever, and it eats at you, don't it? Then it consumes you. Then it takes control of you because it's eating at you. And in some cases, it makes you do things that you shouldn't do. It's got you. Who's paying the price? Is it you? Are those who've done something wrong? Now, who's who's paying the price here for unforgiveness? Is it the person that has wronged you and he's left and went on his merry way never to think of it again? Or is it you that have been so consumed by it, it has grabbed you, and now it controls your life? Or controls a part of your life where you just can't get it out of your mind? You let it rob you. It has robbed you of your joy. It has robbed you of your time. It has robbed you of your energy. It has robbed you in your spiritual walk. Not only do you pay in the physical realm, you pay the price, a large, huge price, much greater than even in the physical realm, in the spiritual realm. Well, how is that? In Ephesians 4 and 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of the mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speakings be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one another, tenderhearted, Forgiving one another even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. What did it just say here? Let's look back in Ephesians 4 and 30. It says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. What happens here? There's another thing that happens. It grieves the Holy Spirit that indwells within you. There's sorrow in there. Taking us physical payment taken a spiritual payment where you're, the Holy Spirit, the inward Spirit within you is grieved. What a price to pay for not a forgiving someone. How else does it affect your walk with the Lord? Now there's an even greater effect here. And if you go to Matthew 6 and 14, for if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But, here's a warning now, listen to this. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. Our walk with the King of kings, the Lord of lords, has been delayed, hasn't it? It's been delayed. Where's your blessings at? Do you think you really can be blessed? Think about this. you really think you can be blessed when you won't forgive someone of their sins? 
when the Lord has forgiven you of yours? He just said that. That's what he's saying here. He says, I'm not going to forgive you of your trespasses if you, you can't forgive them of their trespasses. How do we get out of this cycle here? How do we break it? You can get to a point where it just absolutely consumes you, overtakes you. Think about it. How much time and energy? Really, think about the last time you were really angry at someone. Really angry at someone. And how much time and energy that it consumed. Release it. Set it at the feet of our Lord and Savior, who is in control of all things anyway. Release it and give it to our Lord and Savior. Say, Lord, here it is. I know that it won't do nothing but consume me and cause me nothing but pain and agony. I know, Lord, that this is counterproductive to to me and my life and my walk with you. Here it is. I'm going to give it to you. And let me tell you something, friends, and here's a warning for those who, who tend to take advantage of other people. It's a fearful thing to be in the hands of an angry God. Tell you, as a Christian, if you wrong somebody, you're going to pay for it in this lifetime. You will pay for it. You will be spanked. Held accountable for it in this lifetime. As a sinner, I can't say that. But his payment will be in the afterlife. And believe me, believe me, that's not where we want to be. Believe me, the payment there in eternal damnation. Not only the burning, but it's a separation from the Most High, Jesus the Christ. Let's look at what our enemies are and who our enemies are and a definition of what an enemy is. You might find out after I read this definition that you have more enemies than you initially thought you had. And that is one who feels hatred towards you, intends to injure you, opposing interest of another, a foe. So, you know, our enemies could be someone who hates us, who wants to harm us physically, financially, and one who has opposing interests. So let's look at what God says about our enemies and how we should give or not forgive our enemies. You draw your conclusion on it. Go to Luke 6 and 27 and it says, But I say unto you, which here love your enemies, do good to them which hate you. Straightens us up right off the bat, doesn't it? It says, Bless them that curse you and pray for them that despitefully use you. And I know we've all been there, haven't we? And unto him that smite thee on the cheek offer another. And him that taketh away thy cloak forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asketh of thee. And of him that taketh away thy goods ask them not again. And as ye would that men should do you, do ye also to them likewise. That's the golden rule there, isn't it? For if you love them which love you, what think have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. So what is he saying here? You haven't done anything. You haven't showed any righteousness or holiness by loving people who love you. He says the heathen does that. He says the, the sinner, the unrighteous does that. The lost man does that. You haven't done anything special, have you? And if you do good to them which do good to you, what think have ye? For sinners also do even the same. Here we go. Because you've done something good to someone who's done something good for you, you haven't done anything, have you? There's nothing righteous there. The sinners do that, don't they? Lend to them of whom you hope to receive what thanks have ye. For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love ye your enemies and do good and lend hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great and ye shall be children of the highest. For he is the kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful as your father is merciful. See the problem with the man in the parable of the beginning of the sermon was that he wasn't merciful, was he? Well, we all so tend to want mercy, but oh, it's so hard to give it back, isn't it? That's that flesh. That's that battle that we have between the, the old man and the new man. It says, Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Now listen to this. Luke 6 and 38, victory and prosperity through forgiveness. 
Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measures, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over. What is it saying? You're going to get it back. Whatever you give, you're going to give it back. And I find so often in my life, the more I give, I get so much more back. And that's what it's saying here. Give. And it's going to run over. What does the Bible say? My cup runneth over. Amen. Shall men give unto your bosom, for with the same measure that ye miter, with it shall be measured to you again. There is prosperity and victory and forgiveness, isn't there? And it is scriptural, isn't it? Think about it. The foundation, one of the great columns of Christianity is what? Forgiveness, isn't it? What's the greatest gift of all? The Lord says, is love. You can't have love and not have forgiveness, can you? But, Brother Chuck, you just don't know. You just don't know how bad or you just don't know the story. I know the story. I know the story. The problem is that you've forgotten the story. I know the story that they brought my Lord and Savior before the world's courts and condemned Him when He was without sin and let a murderer loose and brought him and beat him with a cat of nine tails. I know the story where they tore his cloth and they they sold it lots for it. I know the story where they hung a cross on his back and made him drag it up a hill. I know the story and during that he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I know the story. I know the story when they pinned the nails to his hands and his feet where they hung him on that cross and his chest, the pure weight of his chest and his body was suffocating his lungs. I know the story where they put a crown of thorns on him and they spat on him. I know the story where they mocked him I know the story when he looked over to the thief and said, this day you'll be with me in paradise where he forgave him. I know the story. I know the story when he died and gave up the ghost and they pierced a spear in his side and the blood gushed out. And he was separated from the Father. And went to hell for our sake. I know the story. I also know the story that he rose again and was victorious. And he conquered death and sin. But do you remember the story? That he done that for our sins. For our forgiveness. I know the story. Do you remember We are obligated to forgive as Christians. We're obligated. You know, we often so much want forgiveness. We don't want to give it, do we? But I found in my life, and all of us that sit here and are true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, He has never thrown that back in our face, has He? He's never thrown any of this back in our face. If we forgive someone, why do we talk about it? The Lord has never come back and said, Chuck, you remember when you did this to me? But the Lord puts it as far as the east is from the west. And that's where we should put. As far as the east is from the west. Ephesians 4 and 32. And be ye kind one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. No matter how bad it is. Luke 23 and 34. Let's grasp here of what we really serve here. We serve the true and living God who is omnipotent, all-knowing, all-powerful, all-seeing, all-present. We don't serve a fallible gods that the Greeks and the Romans did where they argued amongst one another. Or a God of hatred like Muhammad is, of lies and hatred. Or any other false gods. We serve the true and living God and on His way. Because He knew from the beginning what He had to do to save His people. And on his way, when they had that, he was bearing his cross. Luke 23, 34. 
Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they pardon his remnants and cast lots. During the whole process, he was saying, forgive them, Lord. Forgive them. How much greater price has Christ paid than what someone, small thing that someone has done to you? Now, we're the guy who owes the two million dollars, aren't we? You see where we are? And we're the guy. We're guilty, aren't we? The whole time we think, oh, I would never do anything like that. That man just released me of two million dollars in debt. We're that person, aren't we? That we can't forgive someone for fifteen dollars. We are he, aren't we? We are that person. Whole time we were saying, man, I can't believe someone would do something. And here we are. That is us. Let's don't pay that awesome price. Very important that we don't pay that. How important do you think it is to our Lord and Savior about loving thy brother, by forgiving thy brother? If you could measure it, how important do you think it really is? Well, you don't have to guess at it because the Bible tells us. If you go to Matthew 22 and 34, and I'll set up the scene here. Jesus had just shut the mouth of the Sadducees. And the Pharisees had heard that the Sadducees had just got shut down, as we would say it nowadays, by Jesus Christ. He showed their error. The Pharisees came to him and, and trying to entrap Jesus, as they tried to do many times and failed every time. And in Matthew 22 and 35, it says, Then... And one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Or, Lord, what's the greatest commandment of them all? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. So Jesus is saying, hey, the greatest commandment of them all is I shall love the Lord God with all thy heart, all thy soul, and all thy mind. And then Jesus says, and the second is like unto it. Now listen to what the second one. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You want to know where it sits with God? Second. That's the second most important thing that we can do to emulate Jesus Christ. You want to emulate Jesus Christ, and that's what we're supposed to be doing, and that's what Christianity, or being a Christian is, is to emulate Jesus Christ, to be like Christ. The second most important thing to do is to love thy neighbor as you love yourself. Let me tell you, we love ourselves, don't we? Come on now, we spend a bunch of money on shampoo and... Ladies do the makeup, and the men buy the clothes, and we work out because we want to stay healthy and fit. We love ourselves, don't we? We're supposed to love our neighbors equally as much. That's where it sits with the Lord and Savior. It's extremely important if we want to emulate Jesus Christ, if we want to have a victorious and prosperous life. These are keys to that prosperous and victorious life is to emulate Jesus Christ. Now, you may not be financially wealthy. That's just a small part of life, isn't it? Very small part of life. I'd rather be prosperous in my walk with Christ Jesus. I'd much rather be prosperous with my walk with my wife and my family and my my friends and my co-workers. Wouldn't you? There is that victory and there is that prosperity with forgiveness. But if you don't, you lose your joy, don't you? Don't you want to be joyful? Look at us. We are that man. Oh, how parallel we are with that that man in, in the parable. We have been forgiven of our sins and we have a place at the table with the Most High, Jesus the Christ. We have a place in heaven waiting for us and we are not rejoicing. We're not rejoicing, are we? Where is that joy at? We are He, aren't we? Instead, we're running around looking for 15 bucks here and there, aren't we? And forgetting about the millions that we have been forgiven of. 
We've robbed ourselves from our joy. In Galatians 5 and 22, that's one of our fruits. That's one of our fruits. Joy is one of the fruits of a, of a Christian. And we're robbing it. We're losing it. Aren't we? And we have hope when the world doesn't have hope. In Romans 15 and 13, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. We have that hope. We're filled with that hope. But we're running around here collecting $15 here and there. Mad. Angry. Without joy. In Ephesians 2 and 12, it says that, that at... That time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. We have a promise. Having no hope and without God in the world, but now we have a hope and we have a promise from a God who cannot lie, will not lie, and it's not in His attribute to lie. And I was saying Wednesday night, God, He will not do it. It goes against His attributes. It goes against his being. If he did lie, then therefore he would not be God anymore, would he? And think of what Christ has done for you. Think about it. Meditate on what Christ has done for you and how little our problems are. How small and insignificant these problems are. And what we have to look forward to, yeah? I'm going to tell you, just like that psalm said, Oh, we look around and we see the wicked prospering, don't we? We see them prospering. They can continually do wrong and wrong and wrong and we see them prospering. Friends, this is their heaven. They have no hope after this. We have hope. We have Christ Jesus and we have forgiveness. We cannot take our eyes off what He has done for us. Victory and prosperity through forgiveness.